I'm Nina Davalori, and uh, I have not said this in a very long time, but I was Miss America 2014. <laughs> well, thank you, <laughs> but the image you see here is probably not matching the image you see in front of you today. Because coming here today without a full face of makeup, with my hair naturally curly and no extensions, and trading in my five-inch stiletto heels was a very conscious decision and yet somewhat scary decision because my uh, introduction to beauty started from a very young age. Yes, this is little eight-year-old Nina. I'm with my sister, she's the golden child, she's a physician. Um, but although I was born in New York, I actually grew up going to India uh, to visit my grandparents every summer. And growing up there, uh, I was berated by Fair and Lovely ads and Fairness Creams, which is a huge industry. And uh, flashback to eight-year-old Nina, and I was visiting India, and I had a patch of eczema on my skin. And so I was taken to the dermatologist. The dermatologist looked at me. He gave me a cream. I could have cared less about the eczema. And I looked at him, and I said, can you give me a cream that will make me lighter? And I was eight years old. Now, I went home empty-handed that day, but what was interesting is that when I came back to the US, I would hear comments like, oh my goodness, I love your skin. You're so tan, I wish I had your color. Now, the skin whitening and tanning industries are both opposite and opposing messages, and yet they're both billion-dollar industries. So I have to ask, where do these beauty standards come from? Who's perpetuating them? And what if we wanted to dismantle them? Is it possible? Where do we even begin to talk about this? Well, we're going to get right into that today. That's why I'm here. And in order to answer that question, I get to tell you some very vulnerable details about my life. So get ready, whether you want to hear it or not. Um, but when I was in middle school, growing up here, looking at my environment and media and people around me, things I was watching, um, I realized very quickly that there were three simple steps to beauty. And the first was to have straight hair. Now, I remember the Pantene ads that said, hair so healthy it shines. Uh, as you can see, I did not have that. So my mom literally caught me ironing my hair in the basement, and that was when she took me to buy my first flat iron and all products that would make my hair less frizzy. Step two. When um, a young boy in sixth grade said, oh my goodness, Nina Davalori has a bigger mustache than my dad, it was time to start investing in all hair removal creams, laser treatments, waxing, threading, you name it, I have done it. And step three was a little harder. Step three was to be skinny. Now, growing up in a South Asian culture, your body is commented on like it is their own. There are no boundaries when it comes to body. Um, and so growing up, just everything that was wrong with my body was always brought to my attention by uh, my family. And so I was constantly warned about the freshman 15. <laughs> and I was so excited that I didn't gain the freshman 15 that I did not see the sophomore 60 coming. Um, and that is true. I gained 60 pounds within the matter of a year. And looking back on it, I realized that was really the first time I was struggling with not only body image and body dysmorphia um, and eating disorder, um, I was also struggling with depression. And I had just graduated college. I had moved back home with my parents. I had no idea what I was doing. I was applying to medical school, even though I knew that's not what I wanted to do. And unfortunately, mental health, again, in a large part of the South Asian community, is something that is not often talked about. And my parents' generation really didn't have the tools or resources to open uncomfortable and difficult conversations in our home. And so that was the time period that I had to go through everything I was battling with on my own. And I know it's crazy, because I'm sure you're wondering, <laughs> where does Miss America come into all of this? Um, and I know how this sounds, but in a lot of ways during that time, Miss America kind of felt like an out for me. 
Uh, I'd always known that I'd wanted to be a performer. I'm a dancer, I'm an actor, I continue to love being on stage. And with the talent portion of competition, Miss America was um, something that I was drawn to. And so when I started competing, of course, everyone said, Nina, if you're really serious, lose the weight, you gotta be swimsuit ready. And so I lost the weight, didn't even bat an eye, didn't even question it um, in unhealthy ways. Like I would say the episode of Kelly Kapoor in the office where she's doing that like juice cleanse and she's like, I just bought some size two bikinis, gonna look amazing, is like a very accurate depiction of how I was feeling. Um, and I don't say that lightly, but uh, that was just something, the beauty standard that I had internalized as a young uh, teenager and into my adulthood that I didn't even think twice. Um, and so when I went to Miss America, I will say the one thing I competed with was with the core belief in one idea. And that idea was that the girl next door is evolving as the diversity in America evolves. Uh, she's not who she was 10 years ago. She won't be the same person come 10 years down the road. And it was time that Miss America reflected the diversity in the organization that was representative of what America is today. And so when I competed, I performed a Bollywood dance. I'm actually a, a classically trained Bharatanatyam and Kuchpudi dancer. Um, and so when I competed, I knew that that was going to be my talent. And I can't tell you how many people said, Nina, if you're really serious about winning, change your talent because Bollywood will never win. You're too Indian, be more American. People just don't understand you. Um, <laughs> and I will say, that I thought about changing my talent, but ultimately I knew that when I laid my head on my pillow at night that I had to represent myself, who I was on the inside, truly and authentically. And being Indian was something I was just not willing to give up. And so ultimately I'll always say winning Miss America was never about me, it was about that young girl who I knew was watching that night and for her to finally be able to say, this year Miss America looks like me. And to this day, I do believe that intention was achieved, but I have to ask, at what cost? Well, in the era of 2014 was Twitter, and xenophobia was part of that cost. Twitter erupted in a slew of uh, racist and xenophobic comments, which, sadly enough, I was ready for. I was prepared for that, but what I was not ready for was what came the next morning. And to paint you a picture, I just won. I come off this high, I'm in this dreamlike state, I like slept with my crown, and I wake up and I open Twitter and I see this headline. Is Miss America too dark to be Miss India? I keep scrolling and I see about a 50 more of these headlines on my feed. Is Miss America too dark to be Miss India? And my immediate answer was yes, probably. And flashbacks to my younger years ensued, don't go out in the sun, came echoing back, the fair and lovely ads were just like flashing before my eyes, it was a very dramatic moment. But in all seriousness, I remember thinking and sitting there and asking myself, really? Am I still not enough? And I thought back to eight-year-old Nina who was asking for that skin whitening cream. And I realized that I owed it to her and to all the other young people out there who were dark-skinned to say that I look like you, we are dark-skinned, and together we're worthy of changing the narrative for all of us. And so colorism was really the first beauty standard that I set out to dismantle. You know, I made that my mission during my year, in addition to being the perfect Miss America, which is just not possible because you are constantly judged on everything from not only your race, religion, but what you're wearing, what you're doing, what you're saying. It's not, you know, there's always something. And I think it's, it's poignant to say this because I rarely felt beautiful during that year because I often felt that I was picked apart like clothes on a sales rack at TJ Maxx. And what hurt even more is that I didn't, no matter where I was speaking, whether that was a Fortune 500, a Fortune 500 company, a college or university, or even the White House, there were always two questions I was asked. The first was, do you eat? And the second was, what foundation do you use? And looking back, I knew that all I wanted in that moment was to be recognized for, then my, for more than just my beauty or my outward appearance. 
And while I was struggling with just the image of everything that Miss America is and was and what that comes with and the stereotype, I was also struggling with something else that was new to all of us, and that was social media. This was really the time of like the rise of the influencer era that we see today, and this was just starting. And so overnight, what it felt like to me overnight, suddenly in the rise of this, these influencers, I was insignificant. It didn't matter if I was Miss America, no one cared about my accomplishments. My worth was suddenly defined by my number of followers. I was simply just a handle on an Excel spreadsheet. And that was a game I was not willing to play, so I opted out. And no one tells you this, but when you opt out of social media, it's kind of worse than participating in it in a lot of ways, because this leads to a lot more self-doubt when you're just a viewer, when you're seeing everything happening around you, and you see the highlight reels, right? And so I started questioning my self-worth and value in the world. Uh, why do all the pretty selfies get more likes than the, the pictures of people doing actual good in the world? Uh, should I just play the game? If I'm not beautiful, will I have a voice? Do I really even have a voice now? And for the first time, I just started spiraling day and night. These were the thoughts running through my head. And I knew at this point that I needed significant professional help. And so I think this is where I recognize the difference between my parents' generation and our generation is that in regards to mental health, when we know better, we do better, as Oprah says. Um, and ultimately, I wanted to get better. And so I made that decision for myself uh, to start therapy. And I've been in therapy for the past six years. Don't worry, I will not take you through those six years. <laughs> but I say that to tell you because it wasn't until 2020 that I really started making profound connections between beauty and self-worth. Because in 2020, the world was undergoing transformative change, as we all know. And at that time, I launched a campaign called See My Complexion to End Colorism. And I'd sent an open letter to the CEO of Unilever, which produces the hero product, Fair and Lovely. And in that open letter, I had said the following. Groups such as the entertainment industry, media conglomerates, and companies producing whitening products have poured billions of dollars into creating one very false, hierarchical, and racist image that fair skin is the only type of worthy skin. This image has trickled down and seeped into the mindsets of people, so much so that the majority doesn't realize that they're buying into an ideology that directly feeds into their own oppression. Now, as I wrote this, I paused and asked myself, isn't that true of every beauty product that we buy? And every time I purchase any beauty product, am I directly feeding into my own oppression? And as I dug deeper, the very obvious answer was yes. Because the entire beauty industry is built on the idea that we need beauty to have power or to feel empowered. Now, we know that social media causes mental health issues, especially with teenagers and young girls, fueling eating disorders, low self-esteem, self-harm, and suicide from all these unrealistic images. And yet, we all do things in the name of beauty, myself included. Whether that's skinny brows, thick brows, tanning, skin whitening, no matter what, the beauty trends always are always changing. But there's one thing that will forever remain the same, is that these standards, whatever that standard is, is impossible, unattainable, and unrealistic. Beauty is often messaged to us as empowering and more recently a self-care movement, but do we really need a 20-step routine or a face mask to take care of our mental health? No. And if we need a product to feel empowered, we're by default in a state of disempowerment. And I say this all to say because not only have I bought into this unrealistic, impossible, unattainable standard of beauty, but I've perpetuated it. I used to say that Miss America was empowering and that it gave me a voice, and I have to recognize that I probably wouldn't be here if that hadn't happened today. But what may have temporarily empowered me as an individual does not empower the collective with the beauty standards associated with it. 
When I woke up after being eight years removed from pageant world, like I say, I asked myself, did I really allow myself to be on stage in a swimsuit and ask others to give me a score of one to 10 on my body? And it's really cringeworthy when you say it like that, but the answer is yes. And why did I believe that beauty was the only way to empowerment and that it was the only way to have my voice heard? Because it's not only pageant world that gives out one to tens, it's our entire society that does it in all facets of our life, and we've just accepted that standard. Which brings me back to my original question. How do we begin to dismantle these beauty standards when, in the real world, beauty is literal power? And I think we all know examples of what I mean by that statement. And I think one thing is very clear. We must all push back against these standards. And pushing back against beauty culture starts with each one of us sharing our truth. Because our truth is our power. So for the official record, I'll go first and share my truth. I played the game. My entire life, I believed if I adhered to the rules set by the standards of beauty that were created by the patriarchy, colonialism, capitalism, and white supremacy, that I was going to feel beautiful, empowered, and confident, and deem myself worthy. And I won the game. I won Miss America. And the hard truth is, is that I wasn't promised any of those things. In fact, it's cost me many years of my mental health, ranging from a lifetime of eating disorders to anxiety, depression, and addiction. But in learning this hard truth and during my recovery process, I will say I also discovered that there is hope. Because I know that these beauty standards can't survive if the collective culture rejects them. And we are that collective culture. Institutions can't profit from these unrealistic, unattainable, impossible standards if we as a collective culture aren't buying into it. And so in sharing my own truth on beauty standards today, I hope you'll join me in sharing your truth. Maybe at first, it just starts with yourself. Maybe then it trickles down to you sharing with your close friends and family. And then eventually you'll see the effects that it has on your community, and then hopefully the world. Because believing that we are enough, as we are, is the greatest power we can give ourselves. Thank you.